An interesting fact is in 1919, 11 pups were a gift to the Australian Flying Corps as part of the Imperial Gift upon formation of the RAF in 1921. They actually went to one next year to Point Cook and were used there until 1930. Folks, as we look at the fur ball, the dog fight, as you said, let's look, 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 look. You put 11, the yellow you put 11 on, on its tail is a, it's a fucking triplane. He's really? in trouble, ladies and gentlemen. Really get him, really get him. Remember, ladies and gents, this was just 10 years after the first flight, really. These were developing tactics, they were developing engines, they were developing airframes. It really was, I guess, the crucible of not only aviation, but, you know, air combat manoeuvres, everything we know about aviation today. In fact, engine failures, structural failures, apart from being shot down, were very common. And uh, engineering was progressive. As you said, there was not growing getting these aircraft flying. Well, absolutely, no. the, the parachute was developed and didn't use in 1915, but it was thought if they gave pilots a parachute, maybe they just wouldn't have that guts for combat, and maybe they just wouldn't sort of leap over their airplanes, and so it was denied to them until about 1920. So, fly, fight, and win, that's the only choice. And as Gary said before, the tactics for modern-day combat were being developed as we see it. Of course, they kept developing in fact, the techniques of combat that still developing today. However, roll, pull, G, small turning circle, get on the tail of the baddie, is, is still the same as we see today. And it's worthy of credit that the New Zealand vintage warbirds we see today have travelled, as we would say, across the ditch from the land of the long white cloud. They were also difficult on the ground. They don't have tail wheel steering. They don't have weight. These people on the wind tips. High wind weather affect them. Rain was not wet. It was cold, you froze. These aircraft were quite good man drawing and they did a lot of people to help them operate. As we were talking about before, ladies and gentlemen, you hear it there, the constant fight off of the engine. That was designed because the engine only runs at one speed. So you have an on switch and an off switch. On switch, off. You're continually turning the engine on and off to get the right speed. Oh! In the edge, we've had a game of chicken. Who copped it? Nobody. Aviation skills. <laughs> Pete, I do have to um, endorse you what you said about the New Zealanders. From a worldwide perspective, they're, they're punching way above their normal weight in regards to these World War I aircraft. They've done a remarkable job in presenting and getting all these aircraft on. That's absolutely and deeply appreciated. So as the show, the display of this bygone era, in such a significant moment and time in world history, comes to a close, we and we come here to the horn above the bar to hear this music. For example, this aircraft has a rotary engine. As soon as it lands, the engine stops because remember it's only flat out or stop. So there has to be someone to meet it to guide to uh, pull it off the runway and, and push it in to the hangar. As this comes to a close, Hugh, tell me why it's only been in recent years that aircraft have formed their own story about about Gallipoli. I mean, years ago we never heard about aircraft, we only ever heard about the Gallipoli landing. It, it's... Uh, I, I can't answer that question, Peter. Uh, I ca can tell you on the morning of the 25th of April, 1915, as our boys rowed ashore in the darkness, at landing on the beach at 4.15 in the morning, behind them was the world's first aircraft carrier, Ark Royal, carrying 10 seaplanes, and the world's first balloon ship, Monica, with a balloon at 3,000 feet, looking down and observing. Absolutely terrific. Thank you, gentlemen.